We can represent hexoses, or six carbon monosaccharides, by three different methods. One is a Fischer projection, the other is a Hayworth projection, and since these are six carbons that have formed a ring, it's also a cyclohexane. And cyclohexane can be either in the chair conformation or ring flip to a boat conformation. Most monosaccharides that are six carbons, hence hexoses, are 1% in this form, which is a straight chain linear form. What happens is an intramolecular cycle cyclization where carbon number 5, that OH attached to it, does an intramolecular attack. So this OH is a weak nucleophile, but it's going to attack this carbonyl group. This pair of electrons moves to the oxygen, and then that oxygen with three lone pairs actually attacks this hydrogen. So the net effect is you can have an OH group that originally came from this oxygen, picked up this H, now this has formed a ring, that new OH group can be below the plane of the Hayworth projection or above the plane of the Hayworth projection. This is one representational view of hexosis. In this case, we're looking at glucose. Projection in which the OH is below the plane of the ring is known as the alpha glucose anomer, and the projection in which the OH group is above the plane of the ring is the beta glucose anomer. The anomer results from this carbon being an anomeric carbon. An anomeric carbon is defined as a carbon that is not chiral. Here you see a free aldehyde that suddenly becomes chiral. So carbon number one has become a chiral carbon. This is also known as the hemiacetal intermediate. Also worth noting is that this alpha and beta anomers can interconvert. And when they interconvert, they interconvert through this linear straight chain through that hemiacetal intermediate. Now, because these are six carbons, we can also translate the Hayworth projection into the chair conformation. And this is generally not seen a lot in biochemistry textbooks, this representation of six carbon sugars, um, because the equatorial and axial arrangements of each of these substituents may or may not relate to how these are related in the Hayworth projection. However, it's worth noting that the beta anomer of glucose has, when you translate it to the chair conformation, has the anomeric OH, that is the OH attached to the anomeric carbon, that is in an equatorial position, as well as all the other substituents, including this CH2OH, they're all equatorial. So we tend to believe that the beta anomer of glucose um, is the most stable form. In fact, if you look at it naturally, by natural abundance, this is 63% natural abundance, the alpha form is about 33%, and this is about 1% natural abundance. Remember, as you go from the alpha to beta form, you have to transit through a hemiacetal intermediate. The same thing works for ketoses as well. We talked about hexoses in the previous slide. That includes your glucose, but it could also include galactose, mannose, and all the other six carbon isomers of uh, glucose. We also can do this for ketosis as well. So this would uh, go through a hemiketal intermediate as opposed to a hemiacetal intermediate. So here's your ketone group. This is the Fischer projection, again, 1% of the population. The carbon that determines stereochemistry, carbon number 5, both in hexaldoses and ketoses, that OH attached to it will do an intramolecular nucleophilic attack on this carbon atom. This pair of electrons goes to this oxygen, and then now with three lone pairs, that oxygen picks up this proton. So this has uh, formed a ring. The anomeric carbon for ketoses such as fructose is carbon number two. And in fact, this is the Fischer projection for fructose. Just as before, when this thing undergoes an intramolecular cyclization, the substituent on the anomeric carbon can be above the plane of the Hayworth projection ring. If that's the case, you have the alpha beta anomer. It can be below the projection of the Hayworth projection ring. In that case, you would have the alpha anomer. And you can translate that. This can be translated into the chair conformation as such. Now, you have to remember that these chair conformations can ring flip. And that ring flip um, does not 
involve any hemiacetal or in this case hemiketal intermediate. It's just that ring flip happens spontaneously. With that ring flip, substituents that are formally equatorial can become axial. So usually many textbooks have the Hayworth projection as the best representation to mimic um, a sugar molecule or a simple monosaccharide. Important to remember the anomeric carbon and it's carbon number two in ketosis, carbon number one in aldoses, that's where that free aldehyde is, and then the stereochemistry determinant is carbon number five both in aldoses and ketosis. Notice here that this is not chiral, but then once post intramolecular nucleophilic attack via this hydroxyl group, this carbon atom shown in red, now becomes chiral. One way to distinguish between alpha and beta anomers is the trans rule. So in the trans rule, the substituent that's attached to carbon number five, which is the carbon that determines stereochemistry, it's also the chiral carbon farthest away from the anomeric carbon. When that substituent attached to that carbon is above the plane of the ring, and the substituent attached to the anomeric carbon is below the plane of the ring, you have the alpha form, in this case trans, because this substituent is on one side of the ring and this substituent is on the other side of the ring. So they're sort of trans relative to this ring. On the flip side, if the carbon that determines stereochemistry, the farthest carbon atom, that's chiral, that's farthest away from the anomeric carbon. If that carbon, in this case carbon 5, that substituent is on the same side or same face of the ring as the substituent with the anomeric carbon, as you can see here the CH2OH and the OH are both on the same side or same face of the Hayworth projection ring, then that would be the beta anomer. So that's one way to distinguish between alpha and beta anomers. Again, it's worth noting that the alpha anomer or the beta anomer really represents what is going on at the anomeric carbon. Stereochemistry wise, these are both D isomers or D stereochemistry because the substituent on the carbon number five is pointing up. If the stitch substituent on carbon number five is pointing down, you'll have the L isomer or L stereochemistry. Don't forget epimers, that's another special term. It's a special type of isomer. And in this case, we have D-ribose and D-arabinose. These are five carbon sugars or pentoses. I have them shown here as a representation as a Fischer projection. In both cases, you have the anomeric carbon, anomeric carbon of these aldoses, carbon number one as to be expected. And the stereochemistry of two, three, Three, four, and five is essentially the same if you look at the substituents. The only difference is that this OH group on carbon number two is on the opposite side of the OH group of carbon number two for ribose. So D-ribose and D-arabinose are mirror images of each other at exactly the same place except at one chiral carbon and that chiral carbon is carbon number two. So we say that D-arabinose and D-ribose are C2 epimers. These C2 epimers or C4 epimers or C3 epimers are stereochemistry changes at one carbon atom. Everything else is superimposable as you would expect for enantiomers. However, the superimposition fails at one chiral center and we call that an epimer. So ribose and arabinose are epimers at the C2 chiral carbon. Another example would be glucose and mannose. They would be epimers at the C2 chiral carbon. Glucose and galactose would be epimers at the C4 chiral carbon. The stereochemistry is D because that is determined by the carbon atom that is farthest away from the anomeric carbon. In this case, the anomeric carbon, one, two, three, four. So this carbon determines stereochemistry, carbon four. And since the OH is pointing to the right, we have the D stereoisomer. The same thing occurs with arabinose. So do not forget epimers in your discussion of the intricacies of carbohydrates or mono monosaccharide chemistry. When we join these two together, a, a monosaccharide with another monosaccharide, we have to designate the glycosidic bond. And if the anomeric carbon makes that designated glycosidic bond, we have to determine whether it's the beta anomer or the alpha anomer. So this is the basis for 
determining whether a sugar is reducing or not. A reducing sugar really works for these small disaccharides. To say something that's a huge polymer is reducing or non-reducing is really trivial and, and doesn't really occur because big, huge polymers have one small reducing end. But disaccharides such as lactose, which have a prominent reducing end, can give you a definite signal when you test for that reducing end. So galactose and glucose joined together by a beta 1,4 glycosidic bond is known as lactose. And beta, because it's the beta form or the beta anomer of galactose that forms a glycosidic bond with carbon number four of glucose. One carbon is the anomer, so we have to designate it whether it's alpha or beta. It's the beta form that forms the glycosidic bond. There's nothing special about carbon number four. So we don't have to designate that as alpha or beta. In fact, there's no such thing because it's not the anomeric carbon. An important point to realize is this point here, this end. You notice you have a free anomeric carbon on glucose, that carbon number one. That's designated by this blue dot. That can easily form in the interconversion from beta to alpha or alpha to beta it can form that hemiacetal intermediate, that free aldehyde. Even though it's only 1% of population, of the population, it still can react with a number of different reagents and different chemicals. So we call this the reducing end because of the ability to form a hemiacetal which can react. That hemiacetal or free aldehyde most likely can be oxidized to a carboxylic acid and in turn reduce a metal. That metal can be copper, that metal can be silver. So um, these are many types of reagents that actually can um, oxidize the hemiacetal end and in turn themselves get reduced. So we call that a reducing sugar and lactose is a reducing disaccharide. Biologically speaking, lactose occurs in milk and many people who are lactose intolerant lack the enzyme to cleave the beta 1,4 glycosidic bond. Notice the presence of the free anomeric carbon here that's available for the uh, formation of the hemiacetal and that free aldehyde can react. We contrast this with a non-reducing disaccharide such as sucrose. This is table sugar. Sucrose is a disaccharide that consists of glucose and fructose. In this case, it's the anomeric carbon, carbon one of glucose, the alpha anomer, that forms a glycosidic bond with the beta anomer, carbon number two of fructose. So remember, aldoses such as glucose, their anomeric carbon is carbon one. Ketoses such as fructose, their anomeric carbon is carbon two. So the beta anomer reacting with the alpha anomer, forming an alpha-1, beta-2 glycosidic bond. Notice the two anomeric carbons have joined a glycosidic bond and there is no free reducing end. There's no reducing end here and there's no reducing end here. So because of the lack of a reducing end, because of the inability to reform the hemiacetal or the hemiketal, Sucrose is a non-reducing disaccharide. It would not react with a number of different reagents. It cannot form the free aldehyde or the free hemiketone or free ketone that is possible um, with a reducing disaccharide. So classic example of a non-reducing disaccharide is sugar. Again, these are disaccharides, lactose and sucrose. They only consist of two sugars joined together by a glycosidic bond. One case, they are reducing and in another case it's non-reducing. Here's a common test for aldehydes. This is where the whether a reducing sugar is a reducing sugar or not. So that free aldehyde that commences when a hemiacetal is formed from the anomeric carbon in its interconversion from the alpha to beta or beta to alpha anomer that's only 1%, but that's enough to actually give a positive test for a number of different chemical reagents, such as Benedict's solution, which can take copper plus two and get reduced to copper plus one. In turn, that free aldehyde gets oxidized to a carboxylic acid. Felling's solution is kind of the same situation as Benedict's. It would take copper plus two and reduce it to copper plus one in turn oxidize that free aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. You notice here both positive tests for Benedict's and Felling's involve some variation of a reddish color or a reddish tinge. Also Tollens test. 
tolerance test will reduce silver plus with one uh, oxidation number of plus one and reduce it to silver with an oxidation number of zero and in turn as before oxidize that free aldehyde to the carboxylic acid so in I, all these cases these are redox reactions and the metal is getting reduced and that free aldehyde on the reducing end is getting oxidized. So this is the preliminary early tests for determining whether a sugar is reducing or not. Now we know lactose is a reducing disaccharide, but you also have other types of reducing sugars as well, such as mannose, such as galactose, such as talose, even fructose and some of the ketoses can be reducing if they can form the hemiacetal or the hemiketal. Here's a actual test of the different types of uh, carbohydrates and disaccharides that we studied in this lecture. So remember lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide that consists of galactose and glucose in a beta 1,4 glycosidic bond. There is that free anomer carbon, that free hemiacetal that reacts with the reagent. In this case this is a Benedict's solution and the addition of lactose to Benedict's solution gives a blood red color. The addition of glucose to uh, Benedict's solution gives a blood red color. Again, a redox reaction. These are all positive tests. Fructose is a ketose, and you would imagine, well, can a hemiketal also react and uh, get oxidized to a carboxylic acid? The answer is yes. It can form a free aldehyde as well, an alpha hydroxyl aldehyde. Starch. Starch is a polymer and it's a polymer of glucose in an alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond and these polymers have very very small amounts of reducing ends so starch and sucrose would be a negative test these are non-reducing sugars